if you look at it, this is the pelvic bone with the backbone sticking up. This is the bones of someone that didn't turn to ash completely at Gomorrah. See, they burned up, but they didn't quite turn to ash. They preserved their, their bones. Uh -huh. So that's what's left of someone from Gomorrah. Uh -huh. We have another bone over here in the other case from the same type site. Did you uh, analyze which part of the body of this bone or from animal? No, from... it's human. Well, it's a pelvic bone with the backbone. Uh -huh. Everything's backbone. there except for the skull. So you take... There's no skull. Like the backbone. Okay. Yeah, the backbone right when it comes off your pelvic bone. Oh, oh, oh okay. Okay. It's a, it's a, it's a bit of a bone. See, like this is a bone with the marrow missing. This is another one that burned up. See, the marrow of the bone is missing. Yeah. See, this is the bone that's that was burned at Gomorrah. Mm -hmm. But it didn't quite turn to ash mm -hmm. like those over there. This bone is intact. Mm -hmm. Of course, this is the sulfur balls. Yeah. From Gomorrah. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Wow, and this is big one. That's a pretty good size one. They found one that was 15 pounds. It's a pretty big stone. Ron Wyatt was the original discoverer of these cities in 1989, and he now describes the brimstone found here. Okay, we're to start using this knife. It's very, very sharp. Okay, here this is, and we have collected some more, and it's, it smells and tastes like sulfur. At home, we did our own small test and burn some of the sulfur in a spoon. The purplish flame is indicative of the intense heat which prohibited our holding the spoon as it burned. We later discovered our spoon had holes in it from the fire. Then, we placed a small piece of the outer material also in the spoon and attempted to burn it, but it wouldn't burn at all. It didn't even darken. It was already completely consumed by fire, and nothing was left to ignite. The next step was to see if there were other examples of sulfur occurring in this manner. We consulted geologists and chemists. We researched at libraries and universities. And the result is that we have found no other single case of sulfur in this form, being found anywhere. A piece of the brimstone from the cities was lit at night, and soon there was a beautiful blue flame produced by the burning sulfur. A very strong aroma of sulfur filled the air, and was overpowering if one directly breathed the fumes. As soon as he got home from that trip, Ron took several of the samples to Galbraith Labs near Knoxville, Tennessee. The yellow balls in the center of the reddish rings proved to be 95.72% sulfur, with traces of several other elements, all of which he was told would contribute to an extremely high temperature fire. When Ron asked them if they could perform a BTU test to determine the degree of heat this would give off, he was told that they couldn't because it would damage their stainless steel testing chamber. This brimstone is made of monoclinic, white sulfur that has been burned or cooked at a high temperature. It is quite different from natural sulfur that is formed in geothermal areas. Samples were taken to a lab for analysis. Each specimen was carefully separated and prepared for testing, with the outer portion cast aside. As the samples were found to be 98% pure sulfur, unlike any other sulfur found on Earth. This pure, cooked sulfur is the heavenly marker that was left behind to show the world 
that the Lord, without a doubt, destroyed these sinful cities. Taking samples of the material, they discovered that they broke right off in their hand and disintegrated into dust the consistency of talcum powder, as Greg Brewer shows us here. These swirling designs were also seen in other ashen formations in the cities. This is evidence of extreme heat, up to 6,000 degrees Fahrenheit, where thermal ionization occurs, when the electrons repel and attract, forming these unusual swirling designs. As we took the cable car to the top, the view was breathtaking. The shape of the city was perfectly revealed below us. Here we saw a giant platform-like area, perfectly symmetrical, which was identical to the temple areas of other ancient cities, such as the biblical Shushan, or Susa, located in present-day Iran. Then we saw the raised section, which we had climbed upon earlier, with the sphinx shape and the ziggurat. We were all convinced, but we also knew there had to be more evidence than this. The pressure of the increasing population caused them to enlarge the cities and extend the walls or build new walls. Uh, radiating out from this central or citadel city. Also, we see in these walls uh, pilasters. Now this is a thickening of the wall to give it uh, strength. Uh, one of the defensive mechanisms uh, of a wall was to make it resistant to battering rams our uh, attempts to break through these walls from the outside. Uh, other features that we see are, for example, uh, flying buttresses. These were usually associated with uh, inside structures or on the inside of the external wall to act as a support. Uh, it would not be a good idea to put these on the outside of the wall because they would be easily knocked down uh, or they would serve as a refuge for people that were attempting to break through the wall. Considerable research, chemical analysis, uh, that these are the remains of the cities of the plains. They have all of the structures associated with ancient cities. They have the ramparts above the cities, the jagged uh, uh, tooth defect uh, providing a place for people to hide behind the uh, top of the wall and yet be able to fire arrows down at the enemy. And uh, anyway, we see most all of the recognizable features of ancient cities. We also so see windows. Uh, we also see uh, rooms that have been preserved in the ash. Uh, it's dangerous to go into these and examine them very carefully. 